Welcome to the CISSP Cyber Training Podcast, where we provide you the training and tools you need to pass the CISSP exam the first time. Hi, my name is Sean Gerber, and I'm your host for this action-packed, informative podcast. Join me each week as I provide the information you need to pass the CISSP exam and grow your cybersecurity knowledge. All right, let's get started. Let's go. Hey y'all, Sean Gerber with CISSP Cyber Training, and today we're going to actually be doing a little bit of training around the prerequisites for an endorsement. So as you guys are well aware, as you're taking your CISSP, once you get your CISSP complete, you need to then get the endorsement so that you can actually submit that to CI, the ISC squared and then therefore become a no kidding CISSP. So one of the things that's come up is I have one of my students, they obviously got the CISSP and I was going to endorse them. And as we go through the endorsement process, I've had the great opportunity to be working with this individual for a while. So I know them and I know what their backgrounds are. But at the same time is, is this can happen to a CISSP that you may endorse someone that you may be don't totally know. And so therefore, it's going to be something that the person's going to have to go through the process to become certified, and then you will have to endorse them. If you endorse them, there's some key prerequisites that you're going to need to do. And also the student or the individual that is a taking the test is going to need to do. So we're going to kind of walk through some of that and what you can anticipate as it relates to ISC squared and what you should do to be one, as a student, be prepared. And then two, once you get your CISSP, if you have to endorse somebody, some things that you need to consider before you actually do that. So when we talk about the prerequisites for the endorsement, first off, you have to pass the CISSP exam, right? That kind of goes without saying. And the experience you need to have is basically you have to have a minimum of five years of cumulative, it's a big $10 word, of paid full-time work experience in two or more of the eight various domains that you guys have we been talking about on CISSP Cyber Training. So you gotta have at least two or more of those domains, which honestly, if you're in any form of IT, you will definitely cover at least two domains, if not more. But they're looking for ways to make sure that when you get into this and you take your test, that you understand the concepts because like we've talked about before, you can go ahead and take the test and you may think you know it, and you may pat, even if you're really good at taking tests, you may actually pass the exam, but what it really, that the test itself is designed for managers, and if you don't have a good grasp of it, you will struggle, one, on the exam, or two, if you do pass it, after you leave and you go work for somebody. So it's important that you do have that experience, and it can range in different types of experience. And you, you also, one thing that we have mentioned, and I think it's on one of, I think it's 006, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's one of the podcasts that I currently have. I'm just going to look real quick here. Yeah, it's or for 004. So in CCT 004, we talk about the CIS certi CISSP certification and some of the aspects you need to have around it. So I'm not going to get into that level of detail. We're just mainly going to talk about how do you get, actually get endorsed. So and also, there is a couple of things that you'll be aware of. You can get some other, you can get the associates aspect certification. You can also have one year waived because you go to college. So there's various pieces here that you can do. But again, go back to CCT 004, and that will be able to kind of walk you through all of that. So when we're talking about the endorsement, what are some things you need to do? Well, you're going to have to go to ISC squared and you're going to have to register with them. And when you register with them, they're going to then have a place for you to actually complete the endorsement application. So there's really seven steps that you need to go through. And I'm going to quickly go over the seven steps and then we'll kind of delve a little bit deeper into each one of those. So the first one is you have to click the endorsement application. You have to actually click on that and that will start the process. Then there's going to be some basic um, bullets or you know icons that will go through what kind of certif certific certification certification a yeah, big word. So what certification type are you going for? Is it the CISSP? Is it the CISSP with the various caveats that go with that? Which one are you actually applying for? And you'll have to select that. Then you're going to look for what type of membership you're going to want to go with ISC squared. Like we talked about, if you're going to be, if you don't have all the prerequisites, you can be the associate. Or in the case that I recommend is I wouldn't even do the associate. I would just make sure you have the requisites you have for the full up CISSP. Just because, I mean, it, I get the, the reasoning behind getting the, the associate, but in reality, you're, you're going to want to just get it and do it the right way. But 
it's up to you. And if you feel like you're good at tests, you want to take it early and get it out of the way, that's fine. Not a problem. You just won't be able to call yourself a CISSP until you have the minimum requirements from a duration period. Then you're going to request the endorsement. Now there's going to be, you're going to have to have a ISC squared member number for you to do that. And that would be in the case of if I was signing off for you, you would need my specific ISC squared number that you would add into that document. And then that would actually then send the information to me and it would ask me to verify this your information. You're also going to have to have an experience waiver. This is depending upon if you're going for the associates, you'll need to have some level of waiver for that. You'll have to also upload in many cases your resume, which gives a lot about your job to history and what your background is. And then at once that's all done, they'll review your application. So let's kind of go into some of the steps that you're going to have to have. Again, you need to find someone who's an ISC squared credential holder who can attest to your professional experience. And that can be done in multiple ways, one through a resume and then through an interview process. Or if you even know the person, that helps out a lot. In the case of me with CISSP Cyber Training, I know people that are in my program and I'm able to communicate with them and I understand their background and their history. But I also will say that if I sign off on someone, I'll get the resume and we'll do a conversation over Zoom or whatever else, because I do want to know who they are. And I'm if I'm putting my name out there that I've registered them as a certified ISC squared person, then I need to be able to back it up with knowing who they specifically are. Now, the endorser must be someone who's an ISC squared member in good standing. What that basically means, have you paid your dues and have you reached all of your CPEs? That's an important part of this. And this person must attest to that you are, you have the professional experience. And again, that comes down to the resume, it comes down to conversations and so forth. Can anybody basically uh, totally lie about their resume? Sure. Can people do that? Do people do that? Sure. I'm sure they do. But at the end of the day, when being a CISO and dealing with everything I deal with on a daily basis. If you go ahead and lie about your experience and try to get the role and you get the role, you'll find out real quick, then they will find out real quick. You don't have the understanding that you really need for the role. So it can go sideways very, very quickly. So I highly recommend that you don't do that. Now you're gonna to wanna to prepare the documentation and comply and compile all the necessary documents providing your work experience. Uh, this can include em employment contracts, project outlines, all the things that to prove that yes, you actually physically do, you did work here. Uh, and that can take some time to do that. So you need to make sure that you have all that information uh, and available because you're gonna have to upload all that information to the ISC squared site. Once you complete the endorsement form, then the official endorsement assistance form is available through ISC squared. I have the links that you'll be able to get access to that and you just click on the links and go through that information. The form will ask details such as experience, endorser details, and other professional credentials as well. Now the endorser verification, this is where the endorser will review your professional experience and submits the endorsement form for you. The endorser may require proof of employment, job descriptions, or any other material that substitutes your claim of experience. So in my case, you give me a resume, I see what you've uploaded, I will match that up, and then we'll have a conversation on the phone as well. So that is the way I would look at doing this, the way I've done it in the past, and it, it works well. It's, it's not just something that you can just throw one up there and go. I want to make sure because my number's on the line to ensure that you actually have completed the requirements for the role or for the, the certification. Then you'll submit the application and you'll submit this endorsement application through ISC Square's website. They have an endorsement process. And then you may have a situation where as an applicant, you could get selected for an audit. I will tell you that I've had numerous times with my CPEs, which is your continuing professional education. My CPEs have been audited and we're going to talk about CPEs here in just a minute. But it's important that you do it right. And if it does get audited, as long as you got the paperwork to back it up, you got nothing to worry about. So it's just ensuring that you are doing it the correct way and therefore you're set to go. Now, the review period will take typically anywhere from four to six weeks to process out the endorsement. During this time, they may reach out for additional information or for additional documentation if they need some level of clarification. And like I talked about it before, an audit potentially could be possible for you to provide additional proof to ensure that you have the credentials that you say. Now, if you fail to meet the audit requirements, it could lead to revocation of the exam pass status. So you went through all this work to pass the doggone test, you passed the test, 
Don't goof this up. Make sure you have all the information you need to fill out and provide the information that ISC squared is looking for. Again, you went through all this work. Just make sure you have that before you even go sit for the test, honestly. Endorsement approval, again, that will go through is, is also open to a potential audit, which is fine as long as you have the documentation or myself has a documentation that I need. I am happy to go to ISC Squared and have them audit it because at the end of the day, I want to do what's right and you should do what's right. Now, your activation of your membership, this is going to happen when you, they're going to ask you to do this, that you abide by their code of ethics and pay the annual maintenance fee, which is an AMF or Alpha Mike Foxtrot. And this annual fee will, will pay, will keep you in good standing with ISC squared. Every year you have to pay this fee. And I can't remember, I think it's a hundred and a quarter or something like that is the annual fee. I could be wrong when I record this, it could be a bit more than that, but I believe it's around a hundred and a quarter or so just for the fee per year. Now with that, you're also going to have to do what we call continuing professional education credits or CPEs. Now your CPEs, you have to fill those out each year and you do have to complete those to ensure that you maintain your certification. If you don't do them, you can't keep your certification and they can, they, I will recommend you don't wait to the last minute to do your CPEs because there's a lot of CPEs and it will take a significant amount of time to do them because they ask for some very specific details, such as when you started, when you ended, what is the title of the program that you went through? What is the podcast that you listen to? All of that you're going to have to provide. So make sure that you do this as you go. Do not wait till the end of your cycle to try to do all that because guess what? I've done that. Don't do it. Just don't. It's too much work. I go back and I had to go through all the podcasts that I went through. I went through all the training that I've done and it takes a lot of time. So if you just do it while you're doing it, you know, if you're listening to the podcast after a week, go put all those five podcasts in. If you're li reading or put presenting to somebody when you, after you're done presenting it, put that CPE in. So you'll, what, how this basically works is when you go to the CPE site, you will choose a category. And this category is basically four different topics. There's contribu contributions to the profession. There's education professional development, and then unique work experience. Now you'll pick any one of those four depending upon the situation that you need and what you've done. Now, when you pick one, it's like a tree. It will scale down and there'll be other questions that will follow on based on what you select. Now for this example that we're gonna talk about, and you'll have, be able to see this video, I'll have it on YouTube, but it's also on my in our community that we have when CISSP Cyber Training. It's, you'll be able to see this, this documentation as well, but we're going to focus specifically on a podcast because they're one of the easiest that you can do. Many people are commuting to and from work, or even if you're not, and you're sitting at home, you can then still listen to a podcast. Well, you can use that podcast or that online material to help fulfill your CPEs. The downside with a podcast, as our example, is they're typically anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes. Some of them are longer, but CISSP Cyber Training is about 30 to 45 minutes. So you'll get about a half an hour towards your CPEs, which is great if you're studying for CISSP, but a half hour takes a while to add up a lot. So just keep that in mind as you're adding these different CPE credits into your ISC squared environment. So well, as an education, you, what you'll do is on, as far as for our example, you're going to pick education. Again, this is for a podcast. And then the next sub bullet would be what is an online webinar, podcast, or other material? And then you'll ask for title, presenter, you're published, how many hours did you do it, a summary of it, and then are there, is there any supporting documentation to go with it? So you're going to have to provide all that information. So there's five different, no, six different things that you have to provide just for that one podcast. So it's a highly, like I said before, it's highly encouraged that after you spend a week doing them and listening to your podcast, you come back in here and you add those credits into your ISC squared environment. And then once you're done with that, you'll hit submit. And then that will count towards your CPEs. Like I said before, they will audit you. I've had it happen before. If they do audit you at some point, not a big deal. Again, the part about that it is if you do it the right way the first time, you got absolutely nothing to worry about.
Now, the next thing is when we're talking about CPEs, what are some things you got to keep in mind? So there's a total of 120 CPEs over a three-year period in which you will have to, to do this, right? So it's it's basically designed that you have 120 a credit hour or 120 CPEs that must be completed over three years. So that's 40 CPEs each and every year. And then you just need to make sure you get those done. Not hard at all. Now, you got, there's group A and there's group B. Now, the group A credits are directly related to activities of one or more of the eight domains. Okay, so that's you have something directly spo- towards security operations, something specifically towards any of the, one of the other domains, and you have to have that specifically tied to it. Now, you could re- earn all of your annual and three-year CPEs with the group A. So the group A, you could do them all on that if you wanted to. Now, that makes it a little bit challenging because not everybody can do that. So, therefore, they got, they provided the Group B credits. And these are earned for activities that are indirectly related to the CISSP domains or they contribute to professional development. There's no minimum number of B credits that are required each year, um, but the focus is usually on A. And you cannot go beyond the minimum requirements for A from to bring those in from B. So that's basically saying is that A, you can fill up 120, but when you go into B, you cannot fill up all 120 through the B environment. So it's an important factor to kind of you want to think about, but in reality, you're going to have a mix of both A and B activities. If you start doing podcasts that are specifically around domain one, you're going to actually be able to count that as a group A. But if you went and you taught somebody about cybersecurity um, as a whole, it wouldn't necessarily cover all of any of the domains, but you could count that as a group B type of activity. So again, it's just important that you do this. Now, you must have all of your CPEs submitted before the certification date, before they expire. And this occurs every three years. So again, it's important that you keep all the documentation on how you came to be, you understand you were doing with your CPEs, you need to make sure you have all that documented because they can audit you at any point in time and ask you what you did. And then you need to be able to prove and provide the proof that you did accomplish what you said you did. Okay, that's all I've got today for the CISSP endorsement procedures. It's exciting to see if you're getting your CISSP done, that you are getting close to finishing this up. And you definitely want to make sure that you have all the documentation you need to be able to get your endorsement and to become a CISSP. All right, that's all I've got for today. And we will catch you on the flip side. See ya.